15. What happened to the originals? All critics of the King James Bible will agree on two points of interpretation. First, the word scripture is always used in reference to the missing originals, and second, inspiration describes the singular act whereby God mysteriously breathed out the very words which comprise these autographs. Combining these two concepts implies that the breath of God is in some way limited to the venerable originals and, of necessity, reduces all subsequent copies and translations to an inferior status. Point one, emphasis mine. Dr. Bill Grady. Haters of the beloved King James Bible are guilty of many things including a complete disregard for God's omnipotence. Be sure to grasp the full import of Dr. Grady's insightful analysis above. He further expounds this thought when he states that, without infallible preservation, we are forced to conclude that God's breath evaporated with the deterioration of his originals. 2. The Bible contains 53 instances in which the word scripture or scriptures are used. In every single instance, the word scriptures refers to a copy and not to the original autographs. Not even the critics claim that Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, Paul, Romans 15 verse 4, Apollos, Acts 18 verses 24 to 28, the Bereans, Acts 17 verse 10, or even Christ, Luke 4 verses 17 to 21, had the original autographs. Yet, the copies that each of these men read are referred to as scripture. Not even one of these individuals ever claimed the need to change or correct his respective copy. These simple yet profound truths do not bother the Bible critics. They believe that that which is applicable to a copy in the same language cannot be applied to a translation into another language. These critics further claim that the translation must be a verbal, word for word, and plenary, completely and totally, identical copy for it to be inerrant, infallible scripture. This is a dishonest ploy on the part of any person trained in language studies and familiar with the work of translation. Such an educated person knows that one cannot translate from one language into another without introducing some variation, since certain words must be added in order to complete the sense of the new language. Thankfully, the King James translators indicated these added words by signifying them with the use of italics. Take note that many of the italicized words in the KJB are included in the modern versions without any indication of their absence from the Hebrew or Greek texts. For instance, Psalm 23 verse 1 includes an italicized verb in the King James Bible in order to complete the sense of the verse, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The NIV reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The NIV dishonestly gives no indication of the added word point three. In an attempt to demean the King James Bible, the critic takes his two-pronged attack seriously. He magnifies the originals while despising the italicized words. As is frequently the case, that which man magnifies, God generally abhors, Luke 16 verse 15. The critic places the originals on a pedestal. What does God think about the originals? One of the clearest examples of God's complete lack of reverence for the originals would be his lack of protection of the original Ten Commandments destroyed shortly after God produced them. There is more to the story than man generally recognizes. Many people think that these Ten Commandments written on stone were destroyed before the nation of Israel had a chance to learn their contents. However, God gave the original Ten Commandments to the nation of Israel verbally before any of the Ten Commandments were ever written in stone. Therefore, the people of Israel actually heard God give these commandments directly to them. This is easy to prove from the scriptures. Follow Moses travels up and down the mountain and note that Moses is present at the bottom of the mountain when the Ten Commandments are originally given, as recorded in Exodus chapter 20. Moses goes up. Exodus 19 verse 3 And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Moses goes down. Exodus 19 verse 14 And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Moses goes up. Exodus 19 verse 20 And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Moses goes down, as recorded in the final verse of chapter 19. Exodus 19 verse 25 So Moses went down unto the people, and spake unto them. Moses is down off the mountain among the people when God speaks. The next verses, beginning in the first verse of chapter 20, give the Ten Commandments. 
Many people would declare that the chapter break caused them to miss this important truth. No doubt, God purposely designed the break in this fashion so that only a person interested in taking the time to study the truth will see it. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Moses goes down to the people and God speaks to them, the people, and conveys his ten commandments. Exodus 20 verse 1 And God spake all these words, saying, To I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 3 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thus begins the Ten Commandments in verse 3. The Lord speaks the tenth and final commandment in verse 17. We pick up the sequence of events following the tenth commandment. Exodus 20 verse 18 And all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, and when the people it, they removed, and stood afar off. 19 And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. 20 And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. 21 And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. 22 And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Why were the people afraid of God speaking directly to them? Because they had just heard him speak to them, and they did not enjoy the experience. As soon as God finished speaking the originals, verses 1 through 17, the people turned to Moses, verse 19, and spoke to him. The people told Moses that they did not want God to speak directly to them anymore. The pronouns in verse 22 of the King James Bible shed additional light on this passage. As you may recall, that was a singular second person pronoun, whereas ye and you are two forms of the plural second person pronouns. Therefore, the Lord is speaking only to Moses when he says, Thus thou shalt say. He is instructing Moses, thou, to speak to the children of Israel. He tells Moses to say the following to the children of Israel, Ye, Israel, have seen that I, God, have talked with you, Israel, from heaven. By understanding God's use of the pronouns in the King James Bible, one can understand exactly what has just transpired in this verse. God spoke to the nation of Israel directly. In addition, God gives us further proof later in the Word of God. In case a person continues to doubt the manner in which these events occurred, two other passages clearly prove that God spoke His original Ten Commandments directly to the people. In Deuteronomy, we find the record of Moses speaking to the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 4 verse 10 Specially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them, the people, hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. 11 And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. 12 And the Lord spake unto you, the people, out of the midst of the fire, ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. 13 And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Deuteronomy chapter 4 says that God told Moses to gather the people together to make them hear his words. Verse 13 says these words were the ten commandments. Still doubting? God knew some would struggle with accepting the truth since the truth of the scripture contradicts the sequence of events as portrayed by Hollywood and Charlton Heston. Here is another proof from the dialogue of Moses, speaking to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 9 verse 10 And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words, which the Lord spake with you, the people, in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. As recorded in Exodus chapter 20, the people had received the original Ten Commandments verbally from God prior to their being broken while Moses was receiving the written word on the mountain. Notice that the verse says that the Lord spoke with the people and then delivered the two tables of stone to Moses written with the finger of God. Exodus chapter 31 tells us about these two tables of stone. These are the written originals, unless someone wrote them down when God first spoke them to the people. Exodus 31 verse 18 And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Moses receives these two tables of stone written with the finger of God. Meanwhile, 
the people at the bottom of the mountain gathered together to persuade Aaron to make a molten calf to be their God. They broke the verbal commandments given to them by God, Exodus 32 verse 8. Moses then comes down the mountain with these written, originals. Remember that these tables technically are not even the originals since the original words were given verbally to the people. Exodus 32 verse 15 And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. 16 And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. One might assume that God would think very highly of these prized originals, possibly even instructing Moses to take special care of them. But instead, we read that Moses breaks all ten commandments at one time. Exodus 32 verse 19 And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf, and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and brake them beneath the mount. There go the originals. What is God going to do? God thought so highly of them that they did not even make it off the mountain. Because Moses breaks the originals, God has to inspire some more copies. In chapter 34, Moses is told to make two more tables and God will again write the Ten Commandments upon them. Exodus 34 verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. Moses is told to hew out two new tables, and the Lord will write upon them. We find later in the chapter that the Lord chose to write upon them with the hand of Moses. These copies are inspired. In verse 4, Moses hews out the two tables of stone and goes back up the mountain. Exodus 34 verse 4, And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning, and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tables of stone. Exodus 34 verse 27, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. 28 And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, he did neither eat bread, nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Moses is the one that writes the words, even though God said he would write them himself, verse 1. So, who wrote the words? God or man? God led Moses to write a perfect copy of the originals. This should give some indication of what God thinks about the originals and how his copies have not lost inspiration. Man must not place any greater emphasis upon the originals than does Almighty God. We should believe in the power and omnipotence of God. I do not have any problem believing the King James Bible to be the word of God to the English-speaking people. If the Lord wanted man to live by every word of God, can he not guide the translators by giving them the understanding in how to translate his word? The Lord used natural means to write inspired scripture, thus proving his magnificence. The fact that God could use men to do anything perfect should amaze us all. If he could lead them to write perfectly in the originals, what limits God from ensuring a work of perfection in its translation? 2 Peter 1 verse 19 We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, Twenty, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. 21 For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is what I believe about my Bible. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In the verses preceding this passage, Peter refers to being an eyewitness to Jesus' majesty. Then he concludes that we have a more sure word of prophecy with the written word of God. We have the written word of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and the outcome of this miracle is the Bible. Look at the next example for further insight into the mind of God concerning the originals. Jeremiah 36 verse 1 And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, To take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. The insight you should first get from this verse is that the word of God is basically negative and against you. Here is the original being spoken to Jeremiah. Notice that the word of God has many negatives. It is against your thoughts, your actions, your sin, and you, if you are lost, 
backslidden, or reprobate. Jeremiah 36 verse 4 Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him, upon a roll of a book. 5 And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. 6 Therefore go thou, and read in the roll, which thou hast written from my mouth, the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. Baruch wrote the words, the words of the Lord, spoken from the mouth of Jeremiah. The prophet tells him to read them in the Lord's house. Jeremiah 36 verse 10 then read Baruch in the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Jemariah the son of Shaphan the scribe, in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. Baruch obeys and reads all of the words of Jeremiah. But I thought they were the words of God. Do you see how this works? Jeremiah's words are God's words. Micaiah verse 11 then went to the king's house and told the scribes what he had heard. Jeremiah 36 verse 14 Therefore all the princes sent Jehudi the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shalemiah, the son of Cushi, unto Baruch, saying, Take in thine hand the roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Baruch the son of Neriah took the roll in his hand, and came unto them. 15 And they said unto him, Sit down, now, and read it in our ears. So Baruch read it in their ears. 16 Now it came to pass, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid both one and other, and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. 17 And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? 18 Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. 2 Peter 1 verse 21 Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. One of the greatest indicators of the true word of God is its convicting properties on the tender-hearted, and thus we see its reading produced fear. After experiencing its conviction, the people want to know how this book came to exist. Baruch's simple answer seems almost to mock those who question him. Jeremiah pronounced all the words with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. The princes warn Baruch and Jeremiah to hide themselves and the book while the scribes go and tell the king. They know that the word and the messenger will be attacked. After the king hears the words, he tells Jehudi to get the roll out of Elishama's chamber. Jeremiah 36 verse 21 So the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama the scribe's chamber. And Jehudi read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. 22 Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. 23 And it came to pass, that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife, and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth, until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. 24 Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king, nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Notice that the king's bold attempt to destroy the word of God caused onlookers to lose the initial fear and conviction expressed in verse 16. This is much like the situation today. Critics attack the very words of God, causing people to lose their fear of God. The Lord does not find this attack upon his word an insurmountable problem. He simply creates another original, or is it a copy of the original? Furthermore, take note that this copy contains many additional words not found in the first original. Jeremiah 36 verse 27 Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burned the roll, and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, 28 Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. 29 And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast? Because Jehoiakim tries to destroy the word of God, the Lord pronounces additional judgments against him. These are also to be written in the new copy slash original. Jeremiah 36 verse 30 Therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost. 31 And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and upon the men of Judah, all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearkened not. 32 Then took Jeremiah another roll, and gave it to Baruch the scribe, 
the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Do you see what this copy contains? It contains all of the words of the first original plus many other words. This fact parallels the italicized words found within the text of the King James Bible. The additional words were added by Jeremiah, or Baruch, or God. All three. Who added the italicized words found in the King James Bible? God. Chapters 45 through 51 record the text of the copy. Look what happens to the text of the judgment against Babylon. Jeremiah tells Sariah to bind a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates River. What does this do to one's opinion concerning God's method of supernatural preservation of the original autographs? God does not care what we think. Jeremiah 51 verse 60 So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. 61 And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shalt read all these words, 62 Then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place, to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast but that it shall be desolate forever. 63 And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. In other words, nobody is going to burn his book twice. What does God think of the beloved originals to which all of the PhDs are referring? He is the one that ensured that they would not remain in existence. God will not allow us to worship the paper upon which the originals are written. This may also explain why God used predominantly Hebrew and Greek, two languages that he knew would be frozen in time, to pen his word. God has forsaken and abandoned the originals. He has no use for them, and anyone who tries to dig them up or idolize them is not being led of God. Hezekiah had to destroy the brazen serpent because people were making it an idol, much the same way people would treat the originals if they still existed today. He removed the high places, and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. 2 Kings 18 verse 4 What does all of this original stuff mean to us today? Remember that the second original, copy of Jeremiah chapter 36 had additional words added by God. The italicized words in the King James Bible are a good manifestation of this concept. There are many understood words when the Hebrew and Greek are translated into English or some other language. This is one of the reasons why the King James Bible translators were led of God to italicize these words. One such example is found in Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Man is to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. The translator's italicized word because it is not found in the Hebrew. Check it out! Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. The KJB italicizing word is similar to the second original, copy, of Jeremiah chapter 36. It is an added word in the English when translated from Hebrew. However, when Matthew records the Lord quoting from Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 in the book of Matthew, the word word is not in italics in the KJB. This fact is significant since this one example alone invalidates the critic's claim that the italicized words should not be included in the English translation. Matthew 4 verse 4 But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Word is not italicized in Matthew chapter 4 when the Lord quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is very important because it means that a word provided in the translation from Hebrew to English, italicized, is included in the Greek original. This conclusively proves that the italicized words are not just words added by man, but are in fact part of inspired scripture. Another prime example of this concept is Peter's quotation of Psalm 16 verse 8 and Acts 2 verse 25. As the evidence mounts against modern version producers, the reader might wonder why God allows men to produce these modern versions. The answer is found in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Whenever these false prophets, or false Bibles, arrive on the scene, God uses them to contrast his truth against their error. Here is the principle. 
1 Corinthians 11 verse 19 For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Modern versions magnify God's true word. A false Bible is very similar to a false prophet. Each purports to speak God's word but is, in fact, false. This is true of the prophet even when the miracles come to pass. Read carefully. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. 2 And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. 3 Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. For ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. When we apply Deuteronomy chapter 13 to the modern version phenomenon, we see why the purpose for their existence. God wants to prove our love for him and his word. These false Bibles preach, teach, and prophesy things that the average Christian should know to reject. We must always remain true to God no matter the opposition or how convincing the deception. Satan's scribes have an almost limitless supply of resources available to them, but the truth will always win out in the end. Who killed Goliath? One more example illustrates how the modern version supporter can get himself into some deep water. Who killed Goliath? David right? According to the NIV, Elhanan killed Goliath. Neve. 2 Samuel 21 verse 19 In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan son of Jeroragim the Bethlehemite killed Goliath the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. The NIV claims that Elhanan killed Goliath the Gittite. Why does the NIV make this blunder? The KJB italicizes the phrase the brother of and the NIV chose to remove it because it is not found in their manuscripts. According to the true word of God, Elhanan did not kill Goliath. He killed Goliath's brother. KJB 2 Samuel 21 verse 19 And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan the son of Jer Origim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. The modern version's claim of a strict adherence to a word-for-word -word translation becomes their undoing. If the authors of the NIV so carelessly allowed this error to remain unchanged in millions of copies, how can you trust them? Could this blunder not have been easily fixed in future editions? Unfortunately, pride frequently paints some Bible critics into a corner leaving them trapped. Their pride overpowers their desire to search out the truth. In order for a translation to be authoritative, it must abide by certain strict guidelines combined with God's intervention. The means employed by the translators of the KJB clearly displays their honesty and integrity. In order to achieve an exactness and authority, they utilized italics for the words used in the KJB that were not actually in the texts used to translate. Jacob Van Bruggen, commenting on this aspect of the King James Bible, asserts that to a large extent, the KJV owes its authority to the rule that inserted words were printed in italics. The Bible reader was thus able to see how carefully the translators treated God's word. They were afraid to add even one word, but if they were not able to translate without adding a word for the sake of clarity, they indicated that it had been added point four. Versions today do not adhere to the same principles followed by the translators of the King James Bible. Rather than a word-for-word -word translation, they have opted for a different set of manuscripts, generally employing the dynamic equivalency method. Therefore, not only are their methods wrong, but their foundation is also fundamentally flawed. Dynamic equivalency seeks to translate the meaning from one language to another. This allows the translators to determine the word used because they decide what God meant to say. When a different set of manuscripts establishes their foundation, one can easily imagine the potential for chaos. This fact is borne out in every modern version on the market, as well as in those that have already fallen by the wayside or yet to be produced. Study the italicized words found in a KJB but frequently omitted by the modern versions. The producers of the modern versions have been the greatest critics of the italicized words of the KJB. The resultant confusion caused by these deletions is incalculable. Satan thrives in this type of an environment and the modern versions help to create just such an environment. 
As you compare the passages containing italicized words in the KJB with the same passages in a modern version, you sometimes find these words included in the modern versions. Finding many of these so-called added words in the modern versions is sure hypocrisy. One book stands alone above all the hypocrisy, all the change, and certainly above all the Hollywood hype. One Grady, Final Authority, Op. Sit, P. 16, 17. Two Ibid, page 17. Three Ibid, page 163. For Jacob Van Bruggen, The Future of the Bible, Nashville, 1978, pages 136 to 137. 16. Examining the Errors. The preacher must learn to test the error by the truth and not the truth by the error. To fill one's mind with error, with a view to an appreciation of the truth, is not only most unprofitable but positively dangerous. Point one Alfred P. Gibbs. Similar to stories of other new Christians, I was taken to the local Christian bookstore soon after becoming saved in order to buy a Bible. Of course, like most new converts, I was unaware that there were more versions of the Bible to choose from than there are keys on a piano. For this reason, I depended on others to guide me, Acts 8 verse 31, in the selection process. My new Christian friends told me that they heard that the new American standard was best, so, I paid about $50 for one of the best leather nasts in stock. Nothing but the best for my Lord. Within a few months of my conversion, questions about which Bible began to surface in my discussions with others. Thus, the inerrancy of the Word of God was an issue of importance very early in my Christian walk. After the issue was plainly presented to me, I bought a King James Bible. I made this decision primarily on the basis of God's promise to supernaturally preserve His words for every generation, Psalm 12 verses 6 to 7. I knew the Word of God, the KJB, told me about the Lord Jesus Christ and convicted and convinced me of my need for a Savior. I knew that without the Word of God, I had little or no chance of Christian growth and maturity. However, immediately upon becoming acquainted with the Bible issue, I was bombarded by those who did not think that a person should be limited to only one Bible. Did God really want me to pick and choose the verse in the version I liked best? Why was there so much confusion and discord? One of the individuals who questioned my early allegiance to the KJB was my supervisor in the Air Force. He was a Mormon. After my conversion to Christianity, he and I frequently spent time discussing the Bible. He usually got the best of me in our early discussions since I was still a babe in Christ. Once he became aware of my introduction to a position of belief in the KJB alone, he showed me a book published by the Mormons which highlighted the errors in the King James Bible. Though they don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture, the now Mormons advertise free books of Mormon or King James Bibles, freely printed and distributed, in order to snare unsuspecting people. They chose the KJB because they don't have to pay royalties and it is easier to hide their unsavory dogmas from public view. These events occurred in my life at precisely the same time that I left the Methodist Church and began attending an independent Baptist church in Niceville, Florida. The 18-year-old young man who led me to the Lord was a Methodist, so I had begun attending his church. My new pastor in the Baptist Church and the men of the church clearly taught that the KJB was the infallible and inerrant Word of God. The book that my Mormon supervisor showed me was published by the Mormon hierarchy. Its expressed purpose was to provide Mormon followers with the necessary ammunition to combat the claims of Christians asserting the King James Bible to be the infallible and one's final biblical authority. It is important to understand why the Mormon cult would do this. There can only be one ultimate authority. The Mormons claim to be this authority. One of the first things this cult, or any cult, must do in order to convert someone to their false teachings is to destroy anything or anyone else competing for authority in that person's life. The ultimate objective of such organizations is to become the sole authority in the life of the targeted individual. My supervisor showed me the first error listed in his book. He said this one error was enough to convince him that the King James Bible could not be infallible and inerrant. I must admit, his example floored me and created doubts as to what I was being taught at my new church. I could not respond and felt betrayed by those who had misled me concerning the King James Bible's perfection. However, God's Bible principles always sustain the earnest child of God looking for truth, John 8 verse 32. The Christian's outlook should match that of Joseph. His brethren tried to destroy him and, after many years of suffering with many doubts concerning God's prophecies, he saw God's plan and purpose for his life fulfilled. This is what he told his brethren, 
But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Genesis 50 verse 20. Praise God, he still miraculously delivers. The Lord used the answer to this Mormon error to show me that I must believe in the infallibility of scripture by faith no matter the doubts created by Satan and his cohorts. The error contained in this Mormon book, to which I refer, concerned the differing accounts of Saul's trip to Damascus at the time of his conversion. There are three Bible accounts of Saul's salvation experience. These three are found in Acts chapters 9, 22, and 26. We also read in Acts chapter 13, verse 9 that Saul's name was changed to Paul. Each of the three accounts of Paul's conversion experience records that a light from heaven blinded him as the Lord appeared and spoke to him. Pay close attention to Acts 9 verse 7 as compared to Acts 22 verse 9. Acts chapter 9 indicates that the men accompanying Paul heard a voice, while Acts chapter 22 records that they did not hear the voice of the Lord. The KJB error, as asserted by this Mormon, concerns whether the men with Saul did or did not hear the voice of the Lord. My problem was figuring out how to reconcile these two seemingly contradictory accounts. Even the self-proclaimed scholars have allowed these two contradictory accounts to convince them that the King James Bible contains errors. They have allowed these incorrect perceptions to convince themselves and others that the KJB contains errors equivalent to those found in the modern versions. Such scholars are no better than the Mormon who attempts to undermine the authority of the Word of God. What effect do these verses have on you? Read the next two passages, paying close attention to the two verses mentioned previously, verses 9 colon 7 and 22 colon 9. Acts 9 verse 3 And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, for and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 5 And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Chapter 9, verse 7 plainly says that the men heard a voice. The issue presented to me was whether they did or did not hear the voice of the Lord. When this passage is compared with chapter 22, the supposed contradiction becomes evident. Chapter 22, verse 9 plainly says that the men who were with Saul did not hear the voice. Which is right? Or, are they both right? Do these two accounts in fact contradict each other and thereby prove that there are errors in the King James Bible? Satan wants you to think so. But what does God think? Pay close attention to verse 9 this time. Acts 22 verse 6 And it came to pass, that, as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. 7 And I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 8 And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom thou persecutest. 9 And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Read the two accounts together, closely comparing Acts 9 verse 7 with Acts 22 verse 9. Acts 9 verse 7 And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Acts 22 verse 9 And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Did they hear the voice or not hear a voice? Has the devil put confusion and doubt into your mind already? Has your faith, like mine, been shaken by simply reading these two accounts with a preconceived notion? I say the devil is responsible, because these doubts and the resultant confusion certainly do not originate with God. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 Satan uses every means at his disposal to create confusion. However, God will give peace using the same tools that Satan uses to create confusion in the mind of the believer. For most people, one supposed contradiction would be enough to convince them that the KJB has errors. What about you? Have you failed to realize the necessary element of faith concerning God's supernatural book? It is unmistakably clear that both accounts refer to the same event. What is the answer? Did these men with Saul hear the voice, or didn't they? 
Before we study the answer, every believer must realize that faith is the primary element in believing that God has never failed in his promise to reserve his perfect word. Every Bible student must go to his word with a receptive heart and mind toward the truth. If you don't see the truth, it is not God's fault. It is 100% yours, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. When I was presented with this problem, I could not answer it immediately. Someone had to show me the answer. But the questions initially shook my faith. Fortunately, I was willing to seek for an answer and to listen to the person who eventually provided me with the answer. Thank God that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. Many years later, I learned that the devil was the one who caused me to doubt the accuracy of God's word. It was not God who had caused me to doubt. As a matter of fact, I now refer to this common dilemma as one of God's little rat traps. Why would God allow such peculiar wording in his Bible knowing that cults would use it to create doubts? In the minds of believers? Didn't God know that people would take these two passages and use them to convincingly prove that the King James Bible contains errors? Sure, he did. Consider that he also knew that Satan would twist his words in Genesis chapter 3 with even the garden and the church of Christ would pervert Acts 2 verse 38 to mean baptismal regeneration. Man has a responsibility to believe God, no matter how convincing the arguments. This is true regardless of how our faith is initially shaken. I came to realize that if a man decides to reject the truth, God will let him actually providing the resources for him to do so. Consider a simple case in point, all those who reject the truth of the gospel and go into the tribulation period will receive a lie from God. The Bible says God is going to send them a strong delusion, a lie. This lie will be as damning as rejecting God's word is today. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11 Satan will be the tool used by God to execute this lie. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 to 4 God will allow Satan to sit in the temple of God as though he is God, therefore, it is God that sends the strong delusion. This situation parallels the circumstances seen in the story of Job. Satan attacked Job, but God says he was the one who was moved against Job. Job 2 verse 3. It is important to point out at this juncture that it is not God's perfect will for anyone to remain ignorant of the truth and believe a lie. His will is clearly expressed, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. God provides the truth, but he also points out that in the last days, men will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3 verse 7. Contrary to the Bible, some men still claim that scholarship has reached new and higher levels than those existing hundreds of years ago. The Bible teaches otherwise, and it is unwise to call God a liar, Romans 3 verse 4. The answer to this contradiction in the book of Acts can be easily understood with a little Bible study. The same passages that convinced my Mormon supervisor and the Mormon hierarchy are also the ones that have stumped many a scholar who is ever learning but never able to see the truth. This problem in the book of Acts can actually be answered in a few ways, but what if you could not find an answer? Should you believe God's promise of supernatural preservation any less? No, faith in God's promises is the only sure thing that helps avoid being children tossed to and fro. Paul tells us that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, Ephesians 4 verse 14. Some of the possible solutions. In chapter 9, the men with Saul were standing when it says they heard a voice. Therefore they heard a voice before they had fallen to the ground. Acts 9 verse 7 And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Once the men had fallen to the ground, the Lord speaks so that only Saul can hear him, John 8 verse 43. The men who were with him did not hear the voice of the Lord as he spoke directly to Saul. They also did not recognize that it was the voice of God because it says they saw no man. They were looking around for a man, not looking up. Now, closely read the chapter 22 narrative. Saul falls to the ground and hears a voice speaking to him only. Notice that it is just a voice because, at this point, Saul did not yet recognize who was speaking. It is only a voice until one recognizes the speaker. Then it becomes the voice of the person speaking. Acts 22 verse 7 And I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, 
Why persecutest thou me? Since Saul does not realize who is speaking to him, he poses the following question. Acts 22 verse 8, And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Later, Saul, Paul, relates his detailed account of these same events to the people. The other men with Saul saw the light, but did not hear the voice that spoke to him. Notice that he says it is the voice that they did not hear, not a voice that they did not hear. The Bible plainly points out that they heard a voice. Acts 22 verse 9, And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. As the story progresses, we are told that Ananias came to Saul and that Saul regained his sight. The message conveyed by Ananias is also directly from the Lord. Ananias says that the Lord appeared to Saul and he heard the voice from out of his mouth. Notice the singular, second-person pronouns of thee and thou used to show that only Saul heard the Lord's voice. Ananias speaking. Acts 22 verse 14 And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Every word of God is pure. The Bible says that Saul thou shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. This excluded the other men because Ananias did not use the plural second person pronouns of you or ye. Therefore, the other men heard a voice before they had fallen to the ground as recorded in Acts chapter 9, but they did not hear the voice or the message which was revealed only to Saul. Another way of understanding the difference between hearing a voice and hearing the voice can be explained as follows. A person will say he hears a voice, verse 4, if he cannot distinguish the origin of that voice. However, once it becomes apparent who is doing the speaking, that is, whose voice it is, he may say he hears the voice of that particular person. Perhaps the following example will clarify this point even further. Suppose your pastor was talking to a group of people in another room, but you could not distinguish who was speaking. If someone asked you if you heard the voice of your pastor, you would answer no since you could not clearly distinguish that it was his voice that you were hearing. But if you were asked if you heard a voice, you could answer yes to this question, even if you could not discern the identity of the speaker. With this in mind, realize that the men heard a voice before they fell to the ground in chapter 9. But when God spoke to Saul, they did not hear the voice of the one who spoke only to Saul. Acts chapter 26 sheds additional light on the matter. The time frame of this chapter shows that they all had fallen to the ground by the time that Saul heard a voice that he did not recognize. Notice that the Lord was speaking to Saul only. Acts 26 verse 13 at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. 14 And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. 15 And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. 16 But rise, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, 17 Delivering thee from the people, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. According to Acts chapter 9, all of the men heard a voice, but only Saul heard the voice speaking directly to him. Saul says that when he first fell to the ground, verse 14 above, he heard a voice but did not realize who was speaking. He then inquired concerning the identity of the speaker and learned that he was hearing the voice of the Lord. If you could ask the men who accompanied Saul what they heard, they would reply that they heard a voice, but they could not say that they heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord spoke only to Saul, and he was the only one who could account for its source. But there is more. This is another place in which the old, archaic King James Bible provides revelation superior to that in all of the modern versions combined, and does so without changing one word. Note the use of the words thee and thou again in chapter 26. The modern translations, treating the Christian like an ignorant child, say that you cannot understand a verse with these pronouns in it, therefore, they change both singular and plural second-person pronouns to the generic you. This thinking is extremely flawed and promotes a satanic lie used by the cults and critics alike. By changing the words, the truth is hidden. With these singular second-person pronouns, the, thou, and thy, retained in the passage, the scripture is speaks the truth clearly. These specific pronouns refer to a singular object of the conversation. Conversely, you, ye, and your are all references to the plural. 
Note that the singular pronouns all begin with a T while the plural second person pronouns all begin with a Y. Incorporation of these singular pronouns is yet another way to distinguish that Saul alone, consequently, the, thou, thy, thine, heard the voice of the Lord. No such distinction in the modern versions. When I showed this answer to my Mormon supervisor, he was shocked that there was an answer and that I had it. From then on, he was much more careful in his attempts to shake my faith in the authority of God's book. I never did have the opportunity to lead this man to a saving knowledge of Christ. However, as a babe Christian, I was able to present a clear testimony concerning God's promises of supernatural preservation of his word, Psalm 12 verses 6 to 7. Many. Years later I realized that the battle lines were long ago drawn and that Satan launched his most vehement attack against God's preserved and perfect word. My defense of the book today is rarely challenged by the cults as much as it is by educated, scholarly Christians. Here is a case in point concerning a book written by Robert A. Joyner, DBS, Doctor of Theology. PhD. He vehemently attacks the King James Bible, all the while denying that he does. For instance, Dr. Joyner devotes an entire chapter to listing 20 errors in the King James Bible. Examine his error number 15. In Acts 9 verse 7 when Paul was converted, it says in the KJV the men stood speechless hearing a voice, but seeing no man. In Acts 22 verse 9 it says, they heard not the voice of him that spake with me. Of course these verses make the Bible contradict itself. The KJV makes the Bible contradict itself, too. Of course, we have seen that Dr. Joyner has just been caught in one of God's rat traps. His conclusion after showing all these errors is as follows. The KJV is a good translation. It is accurate in most places, but if you know about the mistranslations and obsolete words, it will help you to understand what God actually said in the Hebrew and Greek. There is no valid reason to reject the other good English translations we have today. In many places they can be a great help point three. Here is a man that has an earned doctorate, PhD, and does not understand how to explain these passages. Instead, his arguments align him with one of the worst, most deceptive cults in the world. He vehemently attacks the word of God with blasphemous remarks. At the same time, he condemns those who claim God has kept his promise of supernatural preservation. Later in the same book, Dr. Joyner attacks again. Throughout the KJV, in small things as well as big, the reader is being misled. Point four. Dr. Joyner thinks man should trust in education rather than in God's word. Shamefully, this is the common response toward those who believe the book they hold in their hands to be the word of God. Read for yourself and see if this sounds like a spiritual answer. Since God never promised a perfect translation, you may have to occasionally check some detail in the original or compare translations. Let the textual scholars work these few problems out. Five. Dr. Joyner's final authority is not the word of God but the textual scholars who have shown themselves completely untrustworthy when it comes to the Bible. He also advises to check things out in the original. He knows we don't have the originals anymore. Dr. Mickey Carter expresses the Bible-believing viewpoint in his book Things That Are Different Are Not The Same. He expresses the necessity of having faith when considering God's promise of preservation. In the words of Dr. Carter, we believe the King James Version is the preserved word of God for the English-speaking people. If it is the perfect word of God, how can contradictions exist in it? There are apparent contradictions in the Bible, while in reality there are none. We need to approach these apparent contradictions with a strong, steadfast, Bible-believing faith that there is an answer to them. But even if the answer cannot be found, why not trust God with it? We can believe it is right because it is his word. We can trust him that he will reveal the answer to us sometime here on earth or, at the latest, when we get to heaven. Amen. What saith the scripture? Does God expect faith to be a necessary element in every aspect of a Christian's life and walk with him? For we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14 verse 23. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. Now, we return to another critic of God's word James White. 
He refers to the subject passage and relates that, very early on, Mormon missionaries showed him his first alleged contradiction in the King James Bible. Here is how he relates the story. The first alleged contradiction that was ever shown to me was based upon the KJV translation. Two young LDS missionaries, Elders Reed and Reese, were sitting in my sister-in-law's home, explaining to me that I could not really trust the Bible because it had been translated so many times. I was a young person at the time, I was the same age as the missionaries, and had not encountered too many real strong challenges to my faith, so I asked them for examples of the errors they were talking about. They took me to the KJV at Acts 9 verse 7 and Acts 22 minutes and 9.7 seconds. Take note that Mr. White admits that someone attacking the King James Bible was a challenge to his faith. However, he concludes his comment concerning these passages with this statement, such ambiguity is, unfortunately, a common problem in the KJV. As we have seen, this perceived problem completely evaporates with a little Bible study. Instead of growing up in the Lord, Mr. White allowed these two cultists to shake his faith and take him captive, 2 Timothy 2 verse 26. He has devoted much of his energies to accomplishing the same goal these Mormon missionaries had, destroying individuals' faith in God's word and his supernatural promise of preservation. God will reward the person who diligently seeks him, Hebrews 11 verse 6. This holds true concerning his word also. In many places throughout the Bible, God personifies his word. That which is true concerning God is also true concerning his word. The word of God is personified in many verses, Romans 9 verse 17, Galatians 3 verse 8, Hebrews 3 verse 7. This application illustrates that anyone who diligently seeks for him or his word will find him. The good news is that his word is not hard to find. Just go to the local bookstore and tell them you want a King James Bible. Be aware that most bookstore salespeople will try to sell you anything but a King James Bible if they sense anything less than a total commitment toward its purchase. In closing, one should realize that a Christian does not have to explain every supposed error in the KJB. Instead, we must condition ourselves and others to embody a different mindset. Rather than encouraging an unbelieving heart that causes us to depart from God, we need to encourage Christians and the lost to take God at his word. When we doubt God, he says we have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, Hebrews 3 verse 12. Paul commended the Bereans because they readily received the word of God and then checked out the truths in the scriptures, Acts 17 verse 11. Christians limit God when we go to the Bible with an unbelieving heart. The Apostle Paul had the same problem with believers in the first century. Many of them were not receiving the word of God, but were instead casting doubt upon its authenticity. Take careful note that Paul said the word of God only works effectually in those who believe. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because, when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The Lord Jesus Christ made the same point to those to whom he ministered. The mighty works of God were limited because of their unbelief. Matthew 13 verse 58 And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. If you have a difficulty concerning some aspect of God's word, the correct response is to believe while asking God to help your unbelief. Mark 9 verse 24 And straightway the father of the child cried out, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. If one continues with an evil heart of unbelief, he opens himself up to the rebuke of the Lord. Mark 16 verse 14 Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Do not be guilty of unbelief and cause the mighty works of God to suffer. Shamefully, the cults are not the only ones who do not believe in God's promise of supernatural preservation. Christians have joined their ranks, have attacked God's infallible word, and have forsaken the truth. No longer do they believe God instructs every child of God to live by every word of God. As evident from this simple example, one does not have to be in a cult to have a hardened heart of unbelief. There are many people who call themselves Christians and still do not believe the promises of God. One day we will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be much better to stand before God having believed his promises too much than to be guilty of infidelity concerning his expectations and promises. For example, 
Psalm 12 verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God promises to preserve his word in the King James Bible and informs us that we are to live by every word of God. Matthew 4 verse 4 But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Is this possible using any other version of the Bible than the King James Bible? Are you busy defending the truth or are you a member of Satan's wrecking crew destroying the faith of the unsuspecting? Don't straddle the fence. Revelation 3 verse 16 Choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24 verse 15 And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 1 Alfred P. Gibbs, The Preacher and His Preaching, Kansas City, Kansas, Walt Eric Publishers, 1939, page 319. 2 Robert A. Joyner, King James Only, Community Baptist Church, 1999, page 18. 3 Ibid, pages 18 to 19. 4 Ibid, page 72. 5 Ibid, page 44. 6 Mickey Carter, Things That Are Different Are Not The Same, Landmark Baptist Press, Haines City, Florida, 1993, pages 18 to 19. 7 White, The King James Only Controversy, Op. Sit, pages 228 to 229.